Good morning, everyone. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, historical analogies uh, that come out of American history on how we might stimulate uh, commercialization. And I'm specifically looking at, at sort of lunar activities, but you could apply it to a variety of other things. Uh, this is um, the result of some research that I undertook a few years ago. There is a monograph that's available on the NASA website that deals with this subject. If you just uh, Google my name and historical analogs, you will pop this up and you can download a PDF if you wish. Could I have the first slide, please? So uh, there are four specific analogies that I will speak to in this presentation. There's others that are in this monograph, but uh, but these are four that I think we can talk about relatively quickly. Some of them you're familiar with, a couple of them you may not be. One, of course, is the Transcontinental Railroad from the 19th century uh, and the way in which the federal government worked to try to stimulate private sector investment and make it equitable for them to engage in the building uh, and operation of a transcontinental railroad. Um, the, the government itself, specifically the Congress, uh, chose to do as little as possible to make this happen. There were earlier efforts to build railroads, uh, no question about that. Some were sponsored directly and owned directly by state governments, by local governments. Uh, the first railroad in the 1830s in South Carolina was a government entity from start to finish. Uh, it did not operate for very long before it uh, uh, transitioned to private sector activity. But nonetheless, uh, there were a variety of models. So one of the things that did happen here uh, is, uh, is land grants that were associated with um, uh, the, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, companies that were working on these things. Could you um, uh, move to the next slide, please? So. Um, they, they arranged private sector uh, financing to help uh, with some government loans. There was property and patent rights that were granted to participating firms. There were revenues produced from transportation fees. There was guaranteed sale of a certain level of activity uh, once the railroad was in place. And all of this proved to be quite successful in terms of developing the transcontinental railroad system that exists today in the United States and obviously has been added to uh, since the first railroad that was completed in, in 1869. So the next question is, how might this be applied in some sort of a lunar transportation corridor? Is something like this even feasible? And the answer to that is not directly, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> lunar land grants are not really possible in the current structure that we have in terms of ownership rights uh, uh, for bodies in uh, beyond Earth. Uh, that would have to be changed. It could be changed. There's a lot of reasons to try to undertake that. Uh, there could also be land right uses for, uh, uh, for the extraction of minerals and other uh, things of value that might be um, feasible in terms of lunar activity down the road. <clears throat> Patents may or may not be something that could uh, uh, evolve to private sector firms, but all of these are potential activities that could be undertaken to support a, uh, a transportation corridor that would get us to the moon. Uh, the reality is we will probably see some of this and some mix of public-private activity as we move out in this area, but uh, we're a long way from that. Next slide, please. An area that we're all familiar with, I suspect, is commercial aviation and how the, the federal government fostered that. It did so in a variety of ways. Uh, some of those were truly unique and, uh, and, uh, and innovative, and others were, were not. Um, uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> commercial aviation was, was an interest in the federal government very early on. It was also obviously an interest in the private sector world. So how do you get to these points? Um, the national security issue was, was real. Uh, the recognition inside the U.S. Army and the Navy uh, in very early on, by, by 1910 at the very least, 
uh, that we had to have military capability to fly for a whole variety of reasons. Some of those were to uh, kill people and break things. Some of those were for reconnaissance purposes and a variety of other activities beyond that. Um, and, and so that was an investment driver, no question about that. The War Department and the Navy Department, there was no Department of Defense yet, uh, put significant funds into these activities for national security purposes and those alone. But since it's a dual-use technology, it could be used in a variety of ways beyond that. Uh, economic competitiveness was also a piece of this. Everybody recognized, at least from 1910 on, that the airplane was going to be a significant driver of economic activity. Uh, it was going to be commercially important. We had to be a part of, uh, of, of this global competitiveness that we were going to see. And, uh, and a third piece of this was also pride and, and prestige, no question about this. And it, it bothered greatly uh, national leaders, both in the private sector and in the public sphere, um, by about 1910 or 11, that although the Wright brothers had invented the airplane, it was an American invention, uh, by at least the, the beginning of the second decade of the, of the 20th century, uh, the technology uh, capabilities had moved to Europe. And uh, there was increasing uh, need to, to recover from this and, no, and, and, and not to lose the edge that the United States had. Uh, next slide, please. So there was a whole variety of efforts. Um, <clears throat> one is national security, which I've already talked about a bit, research and development, the creation of the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics in 1915, NASA's predecessor, uh, was instrumental in advancing technological development associated with flight uh, of all types, uh, specifically for airplanes early on, but by at least the 1940s, also into rocketry. And, uh, and of course, later on, uh, rocketry would become a central part of what uh, NASA was challenged to do as it uh, transitioned into uh, a new life and the NACA became a part of it in 1958. The regulatory environment was a part of this as well. How do we encourage um, uh, economic activity for flying, but also how do we ensure that it remains safe? And, uh, and, and that was a specific task uh, that was put into place uh, through the uh, Department of Aeronautics inside um, the Commerce Department initially. Later on, the FAA would, uh, would take a responsibility for that as well. And commercial development, how do we stimulate those sorts of things? As I mentioned, the NACA was a part of this, the creation of a variety of uh, of what we could call, for want of a better term, port authorities that um, that built uh, the systems that uh, would link uh, cities one to another. The um, the the airports that uh, came to emerge and and uh, and and the transcontinental flying routes that were mapped by at least 1918-1919, largely under the auspices. Of the um, uh, of the postal service of all things, and the airmail became a, a big driver in a lot of these as well. As government services were procured from the private sector uh, to engage in these governmental functions, in the same way that we're sort of doing today with commercial space activities. Next slide, please. So, is a commercial space Line industry possible? Probably. I would very much see uh, capabilities for orbital activities. And quite frankly, one of the things that has happened in the last 20 to 25 years has been the incorporation of Earth orbit into the normal realm of human activities. Uh, it is uh, no longer a frontier. Uh, it is no longer exploratory, quite frankly. Uh, we can engage in activities there that are very useful and we might push back uh, our, our understanding of, of the cosmos in, in certain ways. But, um, you know, it's not an adventure anymore to fly into space uh, in Earth orbit. It's a, an activity, it's a place where we do normal activities. And um, 
And that's really been the result of, of infrastructure that was developed uh, at government expense, the space shuttle and later on the space station. It's now being used uh, in terms of the space station for very aggressive activities, uh, private sector research and, and things that we can undertake there. And there's advances beyond that as well. Um, there are challenges to this approach, of course, and NASA has faced these over the years. Uh, there was a real hesitancy on the part of NASA at the time that I was there in the, you know, about 2000 or so in terms of private sector activities in Earth orbit and uh, how are we going to do this and stimulating um, private sector um, space launch companies and things of this nature and real resistance. We hadn't done it this way before and there were people who said we shouldn't. Um, and there are those who, uh, who pursued it aggressively regardless and we've been the better for it, I think. Next slide. So what about a lunar base? Uh, how might we undertake something along those lines? And I really do believe that the future of a, of a lunar base um, uh, will probably be a lot like a, a, an Antarctic base. If you've been to McMurdo Station or, or uh, the base that's located at the South Pole, uh, you will know that it's there basically as a prestige project. The United States sponsors it. Uh, it's dedicated to scientific pursuits. There are scientists and, and technical people that cycle in and out. And, um, and there's a variety of activities that are, uh, that are undertaken there. So it, it's, it's very public in terms of its, of its activities. It's not very commercial in terms of its activities at this point in time. Uh, that may change in the future. Next slide, please. But one of the things that has happened um, is that the sites in Antarctica have slowly transitioned to being supported by commercial activities. Uh, you know, it was created for scientific purposes in the International Geophysical Year in 1957-58. It's a prestige project sponsored by the government, remains so to this, to this point, but there's an international consortium that oversees all of the activities in in Antarctica and the National Science Foundation, which had operated uh, and has operated these facilities in Antarctica, uh, are, are now doing it almost solely through, um, through private sector contracts. And uh, I suspect that we will see something like this on the moon at the point that we start to build a facility there, put people there. I think it'll be a consortium of, of international partners, probably public and private, each of them putting in some uh, funding to make it a success and sustaining it in that particular way. And quite frankly, I see that happening in my lifetime. And the clock's ticking on that, so I hope I'm right. Next slide, please. So can we have a McMurdo station on the moon? I believe absolutely we can. Uh, viable transportation uh, facilities uh, capabilities have to be developed. Operation of the station would probably be a public-private partnership governed by an international consortium. Next slide. So my last uh, analogy that I'll talk about is tourism. And the National Park provides uh, a bit of uh, analogy for this particular thing. So, U.S. Congress created the Park Service in 1960. Uh, the legislation says that it's, it's to uh, preserve and conserve the natural and historical resources that are under its purview. It doesn't say anything about making them available for people to visit, to participate in things that they would like to do there. Uh, it, it, it's simply a preservation activity, the original legislation. One of the things that happened was the Park Service took action very early on to facilitate the use of these natural wonders uh, for the betterment of all society. Next slide, please. And they did so in a variety of ways. Uh, most importantly, they encouraged first the railroads, uh, and then concessionaires who would build hotels, restaurants, and other facilities in these areas to, um, 
to run the train tracks into Glacier Park or wherever it happened to be, uh, to build terminal facilities there at their own expense with the intention that they could reap benefit when, um, when they uh, were able to, um, to sell services to visitors who might like to use them. And they used them in abundance. There's no question about that. Um, the concessionaires then, in turn, once they achieved uh, profit-making status, uh, paid fees to the Park Service on an annual basis, which the Park Service then would use to build roads and trails and other things in, uh, in these wildlife areas that made them even more accessible to tourists who would come to visit. Uh, an interesting question about this is what would have happened had the Park Service never done these sorts of things? Would it have just been a wildlife area uh, with very few people visiting it? Uh, would it have been successful had there not been a widespread uh, activity to, to, to bring uh, people in to visit these parks? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. But one of the things that did happen through this process was the opening up of the parks for the use of the public and, um, and uh, the benefit of, of all parties, both government and private, uh, and individuals uh, to the use of these things. Next slide, please. So um, all of these are public-private partnerships. They have been. There's a long history of these in the United States. They take a variety of forms. There's an endless um, uh, set of permutations of how these have been accomplished in various settings. There's no one answer that makes a lot of sense. Um, but uh, a, a question to ask is, is there a commercial future in space, and I would specifically say on the moon, through the expansion of public-private partnerships? I'm convinced there is. Uh, there's more information and data in uh, the monograph if you wish to read it. Uh, with that, I will close and turn it back to Pete. Thank you.